everyone and yes i am super super late today for our facebook live today's topic is seven ways to increase your child's resilience so our children's resilience is influenced by two things that is the individual characteristics that they're born with so their genetics and also the environmental influences around them so as parents there are five areas to focus focus on when we're talking about building a child's resilience and these are number one providing education about resilience number two building strong and supportive relationships number three working on being responsible and independent and number four is developing their emotional intelligence and coping strategies number five is creating supported and challenging risk-taking opportunities. That's right, we need them to take risks so they can put themselves out there and have a try. But they, they need to be supported risks. So have a think about this scenario. So a teacher gives every child in their classroom a pack of cards. And on that pack of cards, or with that pack of cards, they have to go away and they have to build themselves a house. Now have a think about how all the children in the classroom are going to respond to that challenge. You are going to get the children who want to make the biggest and the best card house and they start building, 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 and then potentially gets knocked down and they build, 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 build. These are the very resilient children. They'll just keep on going. But you're also going to get those children who build one card house, realise it's tricky, and stop trying and then disrupt everybody else who's building their card house and all of a sudden it ends up all over the place. You'll have the children who um, try and build the tallest card house, the ones that want to finish first, the ones who start building the levels and then they start celebrating every time they build a level. But you are going to see all different levels of resilience. You might see the child who builds one level and then somebody else accidentally knocks them down that bursts into tears because their card house has been destroyed. So building card houses and sitting in a corner and watching the whole process is a really interesting way to have a look at the resilience of the children in your classroom on any given day. Because remember, our resilience goes up and down depending on all different types of factors, how much sleep we've had, how our hormones are going, how much, uh, how many other things we've got going on in our lives that cause us stress and anxiety, how happy we are, if we've just had a break from work or not, if it's a Monday, if it's a Friday, our resilience changes a lot. But for children with learning difficulties, resilience is something that can always have a uh, a kind of a low, uh, what's the word I'm trying to think of? Kind of a low uh, ability to be resilient. So in other words, I have a low threshold. That's the word I was looking for, a low threshold. So it doesn't take much to set them on edge or to distress them or make them anxiety or make them anxious or make them want to cry or give up. So as parents like you and I are, we want to know, of course, what are some great ways of building up our children's anxiety? So, sorry, not building up our children's resilience. So let me give you some ideas. So, oh, where am I here on my handout that I have done today? First thing I want you to do is start looking for the positives. So start looking for all the things that your child does. Now, this can be a piece of homework. It can be something they do outside of school and even something that maybe they're not so good at, but you can actually turn any situation out around and turn it into a positive. So start looking for those areas in which you can make a comment, make a suggestion, or, or show a facial expression that you think what they are doing is pretty amazing. So for children with low resilience and high anxiety, it doesn't take much to sh start to to build them up with the way we use our words and our body language. You know, it doesn't take long to have a child whose messages in their head are always negative about themselves and their abilities. They might say, you know, I'm really hopeless at school. And before long, with your support, you've got them saying, 
yes, I know reading is really hard for me, but I'm actually really good at reading and sport and my reading um, at, at sport and music. And yes, my reading is improving too. So here's another way, goal setting. Now schools these days are quite big on setting goals. I know every year my children went to school at the beginning of the school year, they were expected to write goals. Here's my problem with that whole process. The goals they asked my children to set were always massive goals. They were so massive that it only took one tiny thing for that goal to go pear-shaped when one aspect of that goal wasn't achievable. So what I want you to think about doing here is taking what might be a larger goal, but then breaking it down into a series of smaller increments. So they only have to reach this goal before they get to the next one, then this goal before they get to the next one. That way, when they reach that goal, there's a little celebration and they move on. There's a little celebration and they move on. But let's say with one of the goals, they don't do so well and they can't reach that goal in the way it's been structured around them. Then that gives you an opportunity, A, to help them build their resilience because there wasn't so much weight on this tiny goal. It was an ex a chance to experience a little failure and a chance to rectify their error or their mistake and actually improve on it moving forward. It wasn't a big goal like I'm going to get uh, to this level of reading by the end of the year. It's a goal that says I'm actually going to attempt to read two pages of my book every night with my mum or my dad or my grandma. So think little goals first. So um, you also need to allow your child the opportunity to make mistakes. A lot of parents these days, and I'm probably guilty of this a bit too, we put a lot of cotton wool around our children, particularly when they're already struggling to try and make sure they don't fail any more than they have to or don't make any more mistakes than they need to. But here's the thing, making mistakes is also a great way to actually build resilience, as long as the mistakes they make aren't too life-changing. So it's a really fine line and I know it, but it's really important that when your child makes a decision and they will, that you don't agree with, that sometimes you step away, let them make that decision and let them be responsible for the choices they make. It could be that they didn't do their homework this time or they decided they weren't going to go to sport practice or music practice. Maybe they left their assignment to the last minute and they actually didn't finish it in time. You know, there are parents out there who will actually sit down with their child and do that assignment to make sure it gets done. But there are other parents who will say, you know what, that was your choice, you didn't plan your time, you're gonna to have to bear the consequences of your choices. Uh, and it teaches our children self-control. It teaches our children to regulate their behavior. And yes, there is a fine line because sometimes our children can implode when things don't go well. So it's a case of just building them up slowly over time and getting them to understand that it's okay to make mistakes, it's okay to make bad choices, there are consequences, but it's not the end of the world. It's also important, here's another one, to give your child chores and responsibilities because having responsibility to do a chore is another way of building somebody's self-worth. It's always um, a good idea to model what it is we want our children to do. So for example, if you want them to take uh, a bottle of cleaning fluid and you want them to wipe down all the surfaces in the room, it's a good idea to do that task with the child first. And then you might say to them, we'll do it twice together. And then next week, you're going to do that task on your own. All of a sudden, that child's confidence is boosted because they actually feel like you have given them permission to take on that role and that responsibility on their own and by themselves. So chores and responsibilities, they help us out because it makes our day easier if someone else is taking the rubbish out or if somebody else is doing the dusting or if somebody else is emptying the dishwasher or hanging the clothes out. 
but it also builds your child's resilience and their responsiveness uh, or their responsible behaviors. So it's a really great way. Models and mentors. Now, there's two ways to look at this because your child can be the mentor in areas where they're really strong. Let's say your child is a trampolining specialist. In other words, they are really good on the trampoline, tumbling and flipping and doing somersaults. So they are used as a helper for the trampolining teacher to teach the younger children. So all of a sudden they then become the mentor. But what happens if somebody in the older age group who's even a higher level of trampolining skill then mentors, mentors your child? So you can see they can be the mentor or they can be mentored, particularly if your child has a weakness. Let's say your child has a real problem with um, Asperger's and social behaviour. Um, I know this is actually a true story. There was a boy um, at my son's school who was having a real issue in this area and I was speaking with the learning support teacher one time when we were off on a PD together. And she said to me, you know, um, I'm just not sure what to do with this child. And I said, well, how about you organise, because this, I think this boy at the time was in year eight. I said, how about you organise a boy in year 11 who has a similar profile, who has really got a lot of things sorted out. How about you get them to spend a little time with this boy each week and give them some strategies and give them some ideas? And I can tell you for a fact that that alone turn this child around and they got all the way through school with from going to having absolutely no friends and driving everyone quite mad with their their sort of antisocial behavior to having lots and lots of friends and doing incredibly well in years 10 11 and 12 and blitzed their high school certificate and is now at university yes he still has asperger's and he still sometimes has his social challenges but this child was transformed simply by having a mentor so don't just remember that mentors can be a great way now if you don't have somebody that you can call on there is always great role models in movies in storybooks in life that you can talk about in conversations with your kids so I think maybe, I think this is my final one, and that is developing good open communication and support networks. Having a, a child who has low resilience, but is surrounded by a good group of friends, a good group of sporting mates or chess competitors or uh, performing arts kids, or perhaps they're into scrapbooking or photography, having a group of people around your child in all different areas. So if school's not working, try and have some support networks in other areas outside of school. And you can always speak to teachers about helping put support structures around your child at school if school's um, be, been an issue for them. But remember, school is not the be all and end all. It's really all the um, networks we have around us, our family, um, our sporting or activity groups. Um, sometimes we have great um, religious groups where we can have a support network around us in our religious groups if we belong to a particular religion. There's all different levels of support networks and it's really great to have great support networks around your child so that when they do fall, when they do make a mistake, when everything's going a bit pear-shaped for them, they can actually get the support of everybody around them and they can also see other children, just like them, modelling similar behaviours. So there you go. I think that was seven. Um, I'm sort of flicking through um, my handout here. Um, and for some reason, my headings aren't in bold. So um, if I have missed one, there was a blog post that went out today that actually has all this information in it. So please go there, have a look. Um, hi, Lewis. How are you? I hope you are doing really, really well. It's so lovely to see you. The reason I am so late today is I have just started filming a brand new teacher training course on teaching students with neurodiversity. So I am so excited. Today we did um, 
introduction and part one and uh, it will be launching in May. So I will be telling you all about that. It is specifically for our educators and it is fantastic. So um, that's why I've got all the makeup on. Um, I've been in front of the camera all day, literally, which is why I'm tumbling over my words as well, because sometimes my um, mental energy is a bit drained by the end of the day, especially when I've been in front of a camera. So there you go. That's what I've been up to today, and I can't wait to tell you more about that. I've got more filming tomorrow. So, um, yeah, it's going to be called uh, Teacher Training for Students with Neurodiversity. So I'm talking about all those children that have all those different ways of learning, including all those amazing strengths, and we'll be talking to teachers about how to make um, a real difference for children in their classrooms. So it's a lot of fun. So I will talk to you again tomorrow. Hopefully not quite this late and we'll see how we go. So have a great day, everyone, and I will talk to you then. Bye for now.